So yeah, my name's Tim. Uh, I am an obesity researcher. I, I'm not a professional scientist uh, like some of you here, but uh, I've been doing obesity research most of my life, often like two or three times a day. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm interested in a very basic question. Why do we get fat? Why do our bodies convert some food into energy and some food into love handles? It's a question that's bedeviled uh, scientists, doctors, talk show hosts, talk show doctors. <laughs> Recently, I was having uh, dinner with a friend at a local bistro, and <laughs> I was working my way through a, a, a platter of garlic parmesan wings, and I was complaining about um, why I keep getting weight. Um, and she's like, Tim, have you thought about maybe eating a little bit better? And I said, well... Uh, maybe that's what you think might work, but you know, I'm not sure if the science is on your side here. There's actually a lot of complex science about why we get fat, and you know, so I kind of took her through the history a little bit. Um, you know, since the mid 20th century, uh, our society has been getting fatter and fatter, the so called obesity epidemic. And so, the you know, scientists at first just had a very simplistic model, it's just called calories in, calories out. They said if you you know, if you eat more calories than you burn, then you're going to gain weight. Very simplistic. Um, but, you know, in about the 1960s, uh, scientists started figuring out that it wasn't just how much food you ate, but also the, the type of food was important, too. Uh, the first villains were fat and cholesterol. And as you can see, the thinking there has kind of evolved over the years. <laughs> <coughs> uh, these days, the villains are more likely to be uh, carbohydrates and sugars. Um, in fact, some people don't think this is healthy, which they could be right. So we've got those. Uh, there's a lot of uh, research about brain chemistry and hormones like leptin, um, so-called lipostatic effects, like why when you, you know, a after a certain amount of time you regain the weight you lost on the diet, even if you stay on the diet. Uh, there's stress and trauma, and then there's a large genetic variance between individuals. I'm sure you guys all have that one friend that eats and eats and eats and never gets fat. I hate those people. <laughs> so, anyway, I, you know, was telling my friend about all this research, and, and she said, well, Tim, yeah, I, I get that. I mean, you know, there's a lot of factors and, and all that, but, I mean, you eat really badly, and you do basically no exercise at all. I mean, don't you think there's like a little bit of personal responsibility at play here. And so I thought about that as I was eating my loaded dessert nachos. <laughs> and I thought about it some more as I was waiting for the Uber to take me the two blocks back to my apartment. <laughs> and I realized, you know what, maybe she's right. Maybe there is, personal choice does play a role here. But I thought, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if it didn't? So I redoubled my efforts to find the ultimate obesity theory. I call it the pot gut, present obesity trend grand unified theory. <laughs> the ideal theory would fit all the facts. It would explain and predict trends in obesity, and it would completely absolve me of any personal responsibility. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Some of you may be satisfied with knowledge for knowledge sake, but I believe in applied science. <laughs> So I went at it for months, and then the theory I finally came up with, uh, you guys are going to love it. First of all, look at this amazing correlation between the uh, U.S. carbon dioxide emissions and obesity. <laughs> Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> and it's not just in the U.S. The same thing is going on in China. And this next one will blow your minds. Look at the states that are the fattest are also the states that are taking the most fossil fuels out of the ground. There's clearly something going on here. This is a photograph of a carbon dioxide molecule. <laughs> this is a carbohydrate molecule. Note the similar coloration. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this. As, as plants convert carbon in the atmosphere into sugars, animals like dinosaurs, they eat the sugar, store it in their tummies, keel over and die. Millions of years later, they become fossil fuels, and we take them out and we put them in our cars and we drive around. Now, 
we tend to think of fossil fuels like oil and natural gas as being like a homogenous substance, but they're actually made up of, of just tons of different chemicals. Like look at all these different hydrocarbons. I don't even know what these are, aliphatics, aromatics, naphthenes. Look, is it so hard to imagine that hiding and all that hexane and methane might be a little bit of glucose and fructose? <laughs> My theory is that some of those carbohydrates that those animals ate was not entirely digested, stayed in their stomachs and remains in those fossil fuels today, and it's released as those fossil fuels are extracted and burned. Think about this, how does the human body break down carbohydrates? It's a big complex process, and clearly I made it way too small on this slide, but it's not important. What's important is that it requires all sorts of enzymes that only exist in our bodies. Mother Earth does not have a pancreas. So, I posit the existence of atmospheric carbohydrates, or air carbs. <laughs> you can't see them because they're too small, but the air is filled with tiny bits of bread, <laughs> making us fatter. This explains why our society has gotten fatter as we've ex extracted more uh, fossil fuels. It explains why I've gotten fatter, even though, according to my Fitbit, I've walked almost 200 steps today, guys. <laughs> Take a deep breath. You just gained a pound. <laughs> now, this also, I, you know, has some troubling implications for our lives. First of all, it means exercise is probably a bad idea. The last thing you want to be doing is breathing harder. Really, all you can do is order a pizza, kick back, Netflix, and chill, people. It's all you can do. I mean, you know. Uh, so that's the, that's the bad news, or in my opinion, the good news. So uh, I've shown this to some friends in the fossil fuel industry. They're very much against it. I see some doubt on some of your faces. You've got to ask yourself if you're on the side of free and open scientific inquiry, or if you're on the side of client science denial. So thank you, and I will be selling these scientifically proven carbohydrate filtration masks out in the lobby after the show. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>